So with those housekeeping details attended to, I want to acknowledge the OCLC library, OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Both of these are crucial to our success. And now I'll turn things over to my colleague on the project team, Bruce Washburn, um, who will kick things off for us. Thanks, Mercy. Hi, everyone. I'm Bruce Washburn. I'm an engineer in OCLC Research, working in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm going to be talking a bit, uh, before we get into the details of the project we want to focus on, about some of our past work and the motivations and context for our current work. OCLC has been involved in working with linked data projects for some time. Here's a short list of some of the projects that we've worked on in the past. And I wanted to go over these, just to take a few minutes to rewind the tape and focus on what we learned in some of these that has helped us build the foundation for the project we'll be talking about in more detail in just a bit, including schema.org, linked data, and WorldCat involved transforming MARC data into linked data. And that taught us a lot about shifting from vocabularies that are used primarily in the library domain to vocabularies designed for use on the wider web. And in another project, which we called Entity JS, we looked at explorations of discovery and navigation across different kinds of entities. And just instead of just focusing on works, we looked at people, organizations, places, events, and concepts, and treated them all the same in terms of their, uh, their primacy and their user experience, but linked between them. And that, that we learned quite a bit from that. In a subsequent project called the Person Entity Lookup Pilot, we explored offering the lookup capability as a production service. So that got us to think more about sustainability and the underlying infrastructure, but also about how to handle the uh, identification of entities, persons that might be managed in a local authority file, but aren't currently being submitted to or shared by a national authority system like NACO. And that's another uh, an idea or a concern that we'll be, uh, we'll be grappling with in our current project as well. The Content DM metadata refinery experiment tested workflows for how to analyze and clean up and reconcile and transform metadata from content DM collections in a shared web-based application. If you're not familiar with content DM, it's an OCLC service for building and preserving and showcasing the library's digital collections, a digital content management system. Project Passage took uh, all of our attention for about a year or so. It was um, a major pilot project and it was carried out in 2017 and 2018 we partnered with 16 libraries on a prototype to demonstrate the value of linked data for improving resource description workflows in libraries. And we used the MediaWiki platform and its Wikibase extension to do that work. So we learned a lot about that facility. We also experimented with some um, prototypes for importing and exploring the data in that linked data environment. And finally, we've been working for some time now with the IIIF standard, IIIF, um, an acronym for the International Image Interoperability Framework. And these APIs are a result of an open community effort to make digital materials more accessible and usable. OCLC is an early adopter of these APIs, and we've been an active contributor to the development and testing of that standard. And we used the APIs to build um, a, a index to search across all of the content DM collections, something we had not seen before. And that experiment revealed a lot of potential, very promising, we thought, but it also pointed to the descriptive data variations that we think we might be able to resolve in a, if we move from this distributed record-oriented content DM cataloging system to one that applies linked data principles to describing works and other entities and their relationships. And those findings led to the formulation of the project that we will focus on next. And I'll hand it off to my colleague, Jeff Mixter, to talk us through the current project. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Jeff Mixter. I'm a uh, software engineer uh, based in Dublin. 
Um, and yes, as Bruce mentioned, uh, based on the, the findings from those aforementioned projects, um, as well as uh, based on feedback from the um, external partners we we're working with on some of those various projects, um, our current work is focusing on taking uh, ContentDM uh, digital metadata, digital item metadata, and evaluating how we can transform it, create it, and curate it in a linked data environment. So to give a um, very high sort of overview of what, what that means in practice, um, if, uh, if you think of a, an item in a digital repository, let's say it happens to be, um, as is shown here, a postcard, um, as opposed to having a single metadata record about the postcard that would have all the information about it and things it's related to, like subjects and, um, or, or creators, uh, what we'd like to instead focus on is um, basically describing the individual items or entities com com, uh, included in that record and then connecting them together uh, with meaningful properties. So in this environment, you could have, let's say, a postcard um, that could have depiction relationships to three buildings that are depicted in the postcard. Um, here it happens to be uh, two uh, churches in downtown Indianapolis, as well as the uh, Indianapolis, uh, the Indiana State Capitol. Um, that postcard can also be about a city um, in, in, in general, in this case, Indianapolis. Um, and this is where things get interesting. You can also say then that these uh, places that are depicted in the postcard are themselves contained within that city that the postcard is sort of vaguely about. Um, and then you can also connect the item to um, the, the holding institution. So we can say that this postcard is held by a library system, in this case, the public Indiana, Indianapolis Public Library. Again, that library is contained in Indianapolis. Uh, and then finally, uh, and sort of most importantly for, for the item itself, is that this postcard has digital representations, um, an image at the front as well as the image at the back of the postcard. So that's the environment that we're looking to build throughout this project. So um, as I mentioned, we are working with partners. We have uh, three partners, uh, of which you will hear from two later in the presentation. Uh, we're working with Cleveland Public Library, uh, the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens, as well as the Minnesota Digital Library. So this project is currently spec'd out to be three phases. Uh, we just wrapped up phase one uh, in early January. Um, and in that phase, what we were working on was primarily mapping content DM data into the Wikibase environment that we're working with. And that required working very, very closely with the content DM content owners to make sure that the mappings we were doing were, were accurate and of high fidelity. We also worked on trying to make this data actionable. So as opposed to just creating linked data for to create, for the sake of creating linked data, we wanted to actually make it actionable and, and usable by, by our partners. So we've worked on building um, content DN plugins that can actually be injected into their production public sites that can begin to draw information from this structured graph of data and help populate their pages with little knowledge cards, let's say about things that are depicted in photographs or uh, maps of where the photograph is from, for example. Um, so just trying to try to show some immediate value add to the work. Phase two, which we're about to launch into, will evaluate uh, Wikibase as a platform for creating, for actually creating and maintaining this content DM metadata, as opposed to just storing mapped data. And then finally, phase three will evaluate Wikibase as a platform on which we can build a new content DM discovery interface. Um, so as opposed to just injecting content into the current production site, can we actually imagine building a brand new discovery layer on top of the graph data that we're producing? So uh, with that overview, um, I will turn things over to uh, Jason Roy uh, to give some uh, sort of feedback about his, uh, the, their current interests and takeaways from the project. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name's Jason Roy. I am Director of Digital Library Services at the University of Minnesota Libraries, but with my other hat, I also participate on the Minnesota Digital Library and have been doing so for about 15 years now. Uh, a little bit about uh, the Minnesota Digital Library. It is the statewide digital library for Minnesota and um, began about 15 years ago, like I said, and receives funding through the state of Minnesota's cultural heritage legacy approved amendment that actually sets aside a percentage of the sales tax to support 
both cultural history and the environmental health of the state. And so that's sort of how we receive our funding. And as a result, we reach out to over 190 organizations, um, large and small across the state, uh, to sort of centralize the sort of digital library building to build capacity for these smaller organizations. Um, our new uh, vision and mission statement, which was released just recently here, just to give you a sense of what we're trying to do, who we're trying to work with, and, and sort of our charge. Um, uh, following that is that we work, because we work with 190 organizations, we do provide uh, guidelines, these sort of metadata entry guidelines that are shared with our partners that are managed centrally by our metadata coordinator and that are informed by current practices and updated as changes occur. As you can see here in this example, this is version 5.3. Um, these allow for us to create a level of consistency when we're dealing with, like I said, over 190 separate organizations, each describing their local content slightly differently. This allows us to think of that sort of local uh, information and begin to pull it together into a statewide uh, aggregation of sorts. Um, I've starred some of the fields in, in red because working early on with OCLC on these projects, we were trying to highlight um, where we might use linked data to add value, to sort of create that, that networked environment as we begin to share this more broadly. And you see some of those things like subject headings or keywords or county and state are often nationally sort of recognized controlled vocabularies. You begin to think about creator and contributor and, and how often these aren't going to be showing up in the authority records, the Library of Congress authority records, but they are still sort of a, a, a level of controlled vocabulary, but perhaps more at the state and localized level and how something like Wikibase, how we can work with it to build our own sort of linked data of, and add value to these collections. These are the three collections that we chose to work with, American Swedish Institute, the Becker County Historical Society, and the Minnesota Streetcar Museum. Um, each brought a level of diversity in terms of organizational type, uh, format sub submitted, and uh, the level of description information already available to users. Uh, folks like the Minnesota Streetcar Museum have heavily described uh, materials, the Becker County Historical Society, perhaps a thinner amount. Um, but really bringing these together and see where can link data add value across this sort of pilot set. And like I said, we've got 190 organizations. Uh, we chose three. Uh, so the first was to work with Jeff and the OCLC folks to, to take a look at our data in a new sort of view and using OpenRefine to sort of create a sanity check, as it were, to say, are we consistently applying our terms? Are we consistently able to use linked data as it exists at a national level on our records? Are there areas in which we need to leverage our own or create our own sort of controlled vocabularies? Um, so you think of something like on here, we have keywords and, and uh, Library of Congress subject headings. Keywords are really just subjects provided by our user base, and they can be anything that the local or county historical site or cultural organization finds of importance. And from those, then, we have our metadata coordinator to date work with what is the equivalency? Is there a controlled vocabulary through the Library of Congress that we can do an equivalency on it? Um, and so you say, you can see American Union of Swedish Singers is a key word. Well, we have singers, singing musicians from Library of Congress. That's sort of a sanity check of how we do that. From there, then we begin to think about where can we, using this sort of wiki base, add value? And we quickly looked at working with OCLC on documenting what was in ours, our Minnesota Reflections field type. And this is particularly important because it's sort of a bucket topic field that is, that is sort, of, sort of local to our instance and provides an entry point, particularly for K through 12 students looking to do research, but perhaps not knowing how to enter into this digital library. So it acts as this sort of broader topical entry, be it um, information of broadly speaking of the weather, sports and recreation. And as you see here, people of Minnesota. Well, that's a really odd controlled vocabulary to say people of Minnesota. And, and as you see in the description, it's also really hard to describe. You know, we, we, we'll, we know it when we see it. 
but it's not just sort of a, a place where famous Minnesotans, where the Hubert Humphreys and the Walter Mondales go, but also encompasses some of the portraits, the studio photos, and the other photos that we have of people who resided in our state through the years. Uh, and how do we begin to explain that and group that and create sort of that data? And I know you guys are all sitting back there thinking, saying, well, why does this matter? Why, why doing this at all matters? Because Minnesota Reflections is so awesome already, how could you possibly make it better? Um, and what we're really trying to look at is say, how do we add value in our limited capacity? How do we add value? How do we leverage sort of the, the network of others doing work to provide a better user experience? Um, in this example, you can see, as, as was introduced, here is an example uh, not from our collection, um, but a call a while photo. And you can see how there's descriptive information that's provided by that sort of central content provider. But then through linked data, can we provide information to our users, particularly as they are K through 12 learners, to talk about things like the gold, the Klondike Gold Rush, Dawson City, um, and these other things, and draw in additional information that we don't have to create, that we don't have to store, and quite honestly, our content providers don't have to know beyond the ability to put uh, to, to leverage these terms in their metadata. Um, as you can see in, in this photo, there's also uh, a photo of a dog. You know, so we begin to think also, what is the scale at which linked data and additional information is important? Um, for example. One of the things we reach out to is dogs. And, you know, and yes, there's a dog in the photo, but do users really need more information about what the dog is? Is that helpful? Um, I, I suppose that just depends on whether you're a dog or cat person, but a lot of this is also some UX design on the other end after this proof concept to say, what information do we, do we preference? Uh, what information do we find important and what information most helps our users? And this matters because for Minnesota Reflections, we are really trying to build on the over, overall mission of sharing and repurposing our data in ways that help others to reuse and repurpose our information. And I've highlighted down at the bottom a really tiny icon, which is all about sharing. And it's our, it's our little JSON uh, icon, and it allows users access to the, um, the descriptive metadata that underlies all of our records and all of our search results. Um, we're, by, by leveraging and embedding the sort of linked data URIs that we're talking about, how do we build up that package, we can then pass that information on and our local records become impactful both at the regional and the national level, and yet we're not having to manage that additional information. We are just taking advantage of, of, of this additional information. We are allowing users who then consume our metadata downstream to take advantage of the similar resources that are provided. So this is just an example of our, of our JSON output that we have on any given record that we have. In this case, it's from the Minnesota Streetcar Museum. Um, and from here, I've sort of added a few notes uh, uh, in red here, talking about where are opportunities from more localized, our Bill Olson, who was a photographer in Minnesota, actively in Minneapolis at a certain time, to more broadly based, I am a still image, I am black and white photograph, I am this subject. Um, and to begin to think about if we can add more meaningful information, then we can package it up, as we saw earlier, to, to derive more content. But more importantly, we can then allow other users to take this information and repaint their own discovery environment in a new and interesting way and still be able to take advantage of the same, the same sort of enhancements that we were, be, we were able to take, take advantage of in our own system. So, you guys are all sitting back and you're saying, why the heck does this all matter? And this matters now more than ever because what we don't want to say is Minnesota Reflections is a siloed environment, one of 50,000 siloed digital libraries that exist um, in exclusion of others and unknown to others. What we're working with now is we are in fact in a networked environment. So we want to make sure that our systems, to the extent possible, are taking advantage of standards for description, standards for sharing, and standards to enhance user discovery and understanding of our information. And I, I call out these two, two in particular in which Minnesota Digital Library participates. The first is the Digital Public Library of America. 
and it's an example of how we openly share and that open sharing allows us to be a part of a national infra infrastructure, a national story in which the state of Minnesota, the local and county historical societies within our state can be represented at this national level and shared in an aggregate. Similarly, Umbra Search African American Histories, uh, an example of sharing particular subsets of our records with large national aggregators. In this case, our records relating to African American history and culture and how it relates to, informs, and adds to the records of over a thousand other libraries and archives across the country. And so we're beginning to say, can we share our information better? Can people like the DPLA, like Umber Search, reuse our records in new and interesting ways to drive, drive our content uh, towards more and expanded research? And, and that is really something that we're looking for. And why this matters um, is because if we can leverage this sort of network of information to better inform our own records, uh, how at the macro level the community has come together to describe what is the Klondike Gold Rush, what is a dog, um, we can help enhance at the micro level, at the Cottonwood County Historical Society level, that information. And so really looking to see is there a system uh, an application in place that allows our users, our 190 organizations, to better take advantage of linked data in a more powerful way. And from our point of view, Minnesota Digital Library, it might just be mine, I don't want to speak for the, the, the entire program, um, but what we're really seeing is a shift in how we think about digital library development. Um, really moving from what is on the left is really a passive viewing of digital library. I search, I find, I see to really saying, I'm searching, I'm finding, I'm packaging up, I'm reusing it, I'm repurposing it in this digital humanities project. I am actively engaged participant in building and shaping my own digital library, as it were. And we just wanna make sure that when that happens, when we pass that stuff along, that we can provide them with the most robust and, and deepest amount of information as possible. And I will stop there and pass it over to Mario. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Einaudi. I'm the Digital Repository Manager at the Huntington Library and Art Museum, uh, Botanical Gardens in Southern California. Um, thank you so much, Jason, for that. You actually talked over a lot of what I was going to talk about, and I'll just hopefully build on that with um, showing you a little bit about our library and then a case study that I presented to you last summer for using Mirador. And then I will tie that into this discussion of the greater context that is created from linked data. Just a quick overview of our Washington Digital Library went live in 2011. Um, there are currently over 230,000 objects, of which 160,000 are photographs. Um, 603 are rare books and broadsides. We have over 7,455 maps and atlases. We have over 2,364 manuscripts. Um, most of those are letters, but we do have other objects such as the autobiography of uh, Franklin, and we have drawings from explorers and others. We have 6,604 prints and ephemera, uh, everything from posters to the fruit crate label that you see there to broadsides, or in this case, a letter sheet. We also have, being the digital library for the Huntington Library, we have 712 objects from Huntington history, including the handsome devil who side there, who is Henry Huntington himself. Um, and this is important as we are celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. So what does all this content do, and how can you use it? How can we expand it and make it useful? One of the things that we realized with uh, our use of Content DM is the use of Mirador. So the next example I'm going to show you here is how we use Mirador to instruct, or how I taught teachers to use Mirador to instruct students. So let me give you this example. In front of you, you see an image of Union Station in downtown Los Angeles. It's celebrating its, or it was celebrating its 80th anniversary 
um, last year. And, but what was there before? One of the things that we do here in California is we want to start teaching in our classrooms, again, context, um, which is one of the reasons why I joined this project, because we need to get context into the classrooms and teach students about context. So what was uh, at Union Station before it was Union Station? It was old Chinatown. There was something, you know, a lot of people do not realize that this was an actual area that was vibrant, it was a community, and there are wonderful photographs of that. So, teachers in a classroom talking about it could come to our website and they could see maps of old Chinatown. One from 1888, 1893, 1904, and 1920. They can also find on our site in another collection photographs of old Chinatown. They can see what the buildings look like, or they can see streetscapes. Both of these images are from two different collections within our, our content DM site. So then they can show all of this in a slide deck like I'm showing you now, or they can switch to Mirador. And I apologize, this is not live. Mirador is much better live than it is in synthetic images, but here we go. So this is the 1904 map of Mirador, I mean of uh, Los Angeles and Mirador. If you zoom in, you can see Chinatown, and you can see the streets of Chinatown. You can see Apple Glossa, March of Salt, and Jeanette. Um, and you can see the little alleyways, and you can see that this is this area is fairly well defined. You want to add context though for your students. You can instruct your students to pull up to the left the actual plat map for uh, the Apoblasa tract from 1888, which shows the building as it was being developed, as Chinatown was being developed. This is actually, I think, the second Chinatown. The first Chinatown was burned down. Um, and then they rebuilt it in this area. Apoblasa was the landowner. So this is his tract showing his subdividing of his land. To add further context, the teacher can then add to Mirador an image from uh, Apoblasa Street from the 1930s. And this is the building. There's the corner connecting there, connecting here to the corner. So there are your connections. That is basically what linked data is. As a subject specialist, I have just created a link for the students and for the teachers to say, ah, this is a way for you teaching history to give context to them. You're giving the students the ability to see the area as it was. You can see where it came from. And with the maps being in Mirador, you can zoom in and out and you can give context, especially in the earlier map, the 1904 map, you can give context to where it is in the city. Um, that's what makes Mirador really wonderful. But how can we take that information that I've created here and make it available? And that's where linked data comes in, and that's what Jason was talking about, creating context, creating um, more, more of a way of students to make connections or teachers to make connections with your data. So, we, we chose a number of collections as well, and one of them was the Werner Collection of Panoramic Images of Southern California. And as was talked about before, we had to go through, do the sanity check, go through open refine, clean up data. Um, and for example, here we're cleaning up the date searchable field to have an earliest and the latest date. All that information is brought into the wiki base. And when we're in the wiki base, when this, these entities have been created, we then can run various query tools to see where there is data that is missing, um, to start trying to clean up some of these records and make them um, more robust and stronger. And so one of these queries, we did a Sparkle query tool, tool um, interrogation of the data and we found for what was missing um, anything in the depict statement and one of these items came up um, it was undeveloped land for sale 
we bring up the record in the wiki base and we um, Bruce has built a wonderful connection. He now actually has these links. These are a little older slides, but you can now see the image. There's the image of the area that is missing its location data. We can then zoom in on part of that, and there's now an image annotation tool where we can cut out uh, something that looks very interesting to everyone. The 57 on the hillside. So what does the 57 mean? Well, this is where working with linked data, working with these materials, building more robust um, entity entries creates a opportunity for doing, taking that subject specialty. So we do some research. We find out that the 57 was actually painted on hillsides as part of a Heinz 57 um, advertising campaign and that they were lit by large floodlights. Ah, that brings up a point. In the Huntington collection, we have uh, Southern California Edison photographs. They electrified all of Southern California. And I did a search there and sure enough, there's the 57 lit up by floodlights and it gives a location, Culver City, Los Angeles, California. With that information, we can, and verified where it is, we can then add that back into our own data and say what the 57 was. It's not in the record before. That then can be added as well to the wiki base. All of this information is being cleaned up, and this is where you know, making it more robust than what we're talking about with the later phases, having cleaned up data and having a new um, way of displaying the data. So with these, going back to this linked data, we have the Werner photographs now has a depicted place. We can see that it's Culver City. Culver City now has its own entity with its own uh, USGS coordinates. And with that USGS coordinates, we can run another query, and now we can create a map showing where all the Werner photographs are, um, a couple of them. Nice thing about having maps with linked data, you can see that a couple of them are on the ocean, which means you can go back and look at those. Um, but now we can see where this Culver City uh, undeveloped land photograph fits with the other ones. And when we have the Southern California Edison records for then we can then do linked data for them or do the same query and have it side by side. So now teachers going in will have a map, for example, or they'll have to push content to the content DM site and they'll be able to say, oh, there's a photograph of Culver City in one collection. Here's another one within the same collection. Our data is no longer siloed. But then we can also bring in any of those knowledge cards about Culver City or about the advertising campaigns of the early 20th century. So that's where it's a very quick overview, I know, but that's the idea. We are taking our cleaned up data, our more robust data, making it actionable for teachers to build those kinds of connections, those kinds of context for their students and also let their students go at it. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Shane Huddleston, who's going to take up the last part of this. Great. Uh, thanks, Mario. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Shane Huddleston. I'm the product manager for Content DM, uh, actively involved in the pilot, of course. And uh, I just kind of want to give a couple, some brief comments about what is next. Um, so we today have been talking about phase one, and um, you know that was largely about getting the, the system, the pilot system running, uh, migrating the textual descriptions, um, and we learned a lot from that processing, and we um, have really improved, developed and improved the methods to, to kind of repeat that process so that we can bring more institutions in to the pilot, um, and also with a there's always that eye towards potential uh, production grade services that could come out of uh, come out of this work. 
Um, so now that we have a functioning system, it's populated with real data, uh, real content. And so for phase two, we're shifting our focus to the staff tools. So what, what, is, what do you need to create new descriptions, to manage your existing descriptions? Um, and it's very interesting, the um, operating with metadata descriptions that are entity-based allows all of us in the pilot to be, I think, much more open-minded in how we approach um, library staff workflows. So, you know, we can kind of break down some, some old habits and really experiment with new ways of thinking about how to describe all of this information and make it uh, drive more value from the work that we all do. So for phase two, we'll be prototyping interfaces um, for managing these descriptions, um, obviously getting lots of feedback from all of our partners. Um, those are the key goals for phase two. Um, we're also really um, very happy to welcome two additional institutions for the second phase. Um, a very heartfelt thanks to uh, Temple University and the University of Miami for joining the pilot at this point. And phase two gets underway uh, real soon in February. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Shane, for uh, giving us a preview of what's next. Um, at this point, um, I just really wanted to thank all of our panelists for, uh, especially to uh, Jason and Mario for sharing your perspectives on um, the experience of being in the pilot and, and the, the value uh, that you're, you're seeing in it. Uh, so at this point, uh, we have some time for our panelists to uh, answer some additional questions. Uh, we'd love to hear some comments from you. If you have any questions, please go ahead and enter them into chat. You'll want to uh, type them into your chat box there and make sure that the send to option is to all participants. So I will give you all a, a chance to mull over your questions and um, uh, pop some things into there. Um, I, I thought maybe to get us started off, I'd pose a couple questions that, that, I, that I have in mind and would uh, love to get some feedback from the panelists. Um, so I think starting with our uh, project participants, uh, for Jason, for Mario, um, you know, there, there was a lot presented today that points to exciting future possibilities, but it would also be helpful to hear, uh, drawing on your experiences as, as participants in this project, um, what are some of the things that library staff could do now, could be thinking about, could be preparing now to position themselves for this future, uh, to be linked data ready? Um, I think it would be helpful to hear your perspectives on that. Um, and Jason, I, I might ask you to start if you'd be ready to chime in about that. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's important that, that we understand the data we have um, before we jump from A to Z, that, that there are steps B, C, and D along the way. In terms of, in our case, we've got lots of local content contributors, each describing the material slightly different. And the ability for us to take that, that sort of smoothing, that overall look and say, can we provide consistent data quality against it? Can we clean up our data so that it is in a position to be linked data ready? It doesn't have to be linked data yet, but we begin to look, can we build some controlled vocabulary, some oversight and, and take a look at our data and make sure it is clean and is in the best possible shape when we do want to hand it over or move forward with this, this process, this program, that the data that we contributed to this process is as clean as possible. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Mario, I was just wondering if you might have anything to add um, to that before I move on to the next question. I would just wholeheartedly concur with what Jason said. I, having the cleanest possible data and consistent data um, is really what's very, very important. And um, yes, you can go and clean it up, um, but having it ready from the beginning would make it much, much easier. Uh, as he said, you can't jump from A to Z without, without going through BCD. Um, so that's very, very important. And um, it sort of makes you do a double check, too, of all of your work, 
when you go through this process. Great. Thanks. And so I see that uh, we've got a question um, that I'll read out now. During the Huntington portion of the presentation, identifying a location for the undeveloped land photo was discussed. I thought that the uh, presentation mentioned a triple IF image annotation tool currently available within Content DM. Was this correct? If so, could we hear a bit more about this tool? Um, and I'm going to open it up to the project team to um, have someone jump in and uh, answer that. Uh, this is Bruce, um, and thanks for the question. The the tool that we that was mentioned, it's not available within the Content DM system, but it's a feature of the Content DM Link Data Pilot application, which is, as was mentioned, it's a set of applications that are part of the Wikibase ecosystem or kind of are aligned with that system. So it isn't in the production content DM user interface yet. And Mercy, I don't know if it's possible to um, to demonstrate some of this, but it might make more sense to show quickly what the image annotation tool is for and how it works. If I sent you a URL in chat, yeah. would you be able to follow that link? Yeah, or actually, Bruce, I could probably just give you um, uh, control of the screen and you could share your screen if you wanted to pull that up. Or I could just give you a, a couple minutes to do that and uh, we have a, another question that's come up, so we might chat about that first and then you could have things queued up. And Yeah, I'm ready to share my screen now if that's convenient. Oh, sure, yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. I will hand things over to you. Okay. Okay, um, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see? Yes, we, we do see uh, the Edwin Hubble um, image. Yeah, so this is one item, a um, photograph of Edwin Hubble, and uh, it's described with various statements in our Wikibase implementation. But one of the things we wanted to do is enhance the description by letting people look at the image and say, well, there's something depicted in this image, and I want to link to a separate entity describing that. So we built this separate application that kind of sits on top of the Wikibase foundation. So it can talk to the Wikibase database and make changes to it, but it's its own separate application. And it looks like this. It's a pretty simple interface where it focuses on the image and it lists the subject headings, what the image is about, <clears throat> excuse me, about or what it depicts. And then for those subjects, it gives the user an opportunity to crop the image and say what kind of a thing this is. Um, maybe someone on the call has an understanding of antique astronomical equipment. This is something sort of a museum quality device that we hadn't uh, ascertained exactly what it is. But if you wanted to add that depiction into the system, you could search for what it is. Um, it's not an astrolabe, but let's pretend it was. You could look for entities that are described in the Wikibase, select that, select this button to take that picture. And now if we added that depiction back into the Wikibase, now we've got some more connectivity, some more semantic richness associated with, with the image. So using the IIIF APIs and using some simple software to crop portions of the image, we're trying to maximize the facility of these available technologies to, to encourage more rich uh, descriptions in, in the interface. And this is uh, Jeff Mixter. Uh, just to follow up on that, um, what Bruce has been showing, uh, while all of this um, sort of annotation data does indeed reside uh, within the wiki base, the ultimate goal um, related to uh, Benjamin's question is to push this into IIIF. Um, so it would be, you would be able to open up that image in something like Mirador and see um, the annotations cropped out um, as you do with um, sort of other IIIF uh, demonstrations. So this is just sort of a vehicle to create the data um, to ultimately publish it as IIIF data. Thanks, Bruce and Jeff. Appreciate the um, 
the quick demo there. Um, that was fun, fun to see. So I know that we have uh, another question that's come up. I'm thinking that um, Mario and or Jason, you might want to uh, take a stab at answering this. Are there new skills library staff should be acquiring to work in a linked data world, or do we already have the skills? Jason or Mario, do you have any thoughts on that? This is Mario. Um, I think most of us have the skills already. Um, that's a really tough question because I view – so a lot of us are subject specialists. I'm trying to wrap my head around this um, uh, in various ways, shapes, or forms. And I think we do have the skill set because what we're doing is we're describing something um, and creating more robust data and then linking that data through systems like the Wikibase that Jeff and Bruce have built. Um, so I, I, it helps to have uh, definitely some of the programming side, uh, or at least to have an understanding of it so you can see how machines think as well. But I think the majority of us have enough knowledge perhaps just to be dangerous, but enough there to actually do some of the work that is needed to create the clean metadata, to create the, um, the information that is needed to create that linked data. Um, that may not be a satisfactory answer, but um, sort of on the spot, that's the best I can do right now. And, and I will just chime in following along on what Mario said is, you know, we have the historical ability and the skills in terms of knowing the content, describing the content standards. I think where we're trying to get to is what are the skills we need in order to work with people who want to reuse our data as we begin to share our data and manipulate our, our data, not just for our own systems that we understand very well, but for systems that we have no idea how they're being used because somebody else is building them, is employing them, isn't using them. But our role is sort of being able to translate our information in a meaningful way that can hand off that package for reuse to somebody else. You know, and, and that's sort of a, a conversation of I don't have to be a technologist, but I know how to spe I know, need to know how to speak technologies, as it were, um, will be helpful. Thanks, Jason and Mario. Appreciate your thoughts on that, and, and I think that's that's going to be an ongoing uh, question we'll be looking into: is what what kinds of skills um, uh, to help library staff be linked data ready? Uh, we have another question that's come in, uh, and this is: How well has Wikibase soft has the Wikibase software package served as the metadata technology? Um, and I'd love someone on the project team to uh, speak to this. Hi, this is uh, Jeff Mixter again. Uh, we've actually been very impressed by um, how well it uh, performs, um, not only from a sort of technology standpoint, but also from a functional standpoint. Um, so as Bruce mentioned way back in the beginning, we used uh, Wikibase actually as the foundation uh, for Project Passage, uh, which was focused primarily on describing authorities um, as linked data entities. Um, whereas this project's mainly focused on describing um, more traditional items, if you, if you will. Um, but uh, you know, regardless of, of what you're trying to describe, um, not only have the, um, the out-of-the-box tools worked very, very well, um, but it's also um, it, the very nice thing about uh, the Wikibase platform is that it has a very robust set of APIs. So that annotator uh, that Bruce was demoing a few minutes ago um, all of that, that entire application is actually being driven more or less by uh, Wikibase APIs, not only to get data, but also to push data back to the system. So um, from, from that standpoint, it's worked out uh, very, very well um, in that it's easy to, to set up, uh, it's intuitive to work with, um, and it's also very um, user-friendly to interact with if you want to build applications outside of its out-of-the-box features. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, since you spoke a bit about uh, 
Wikibase working well and, and uh, the activities in phase one uh, validating that. Uh, I'm wondering if there's anything else you might add on either uh, related to some learnings from phase one. So either something else that's been validated or something that's come into clearer focus in terms of uh, areas that need further investigation uh, in the coming phases. Hi, this is this is Jeff again. Um, just quickly, uh, Bruce and I were actually just just talking about this uh, yesterday. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways from from phase one for us has been um, the difficulty in creating a model for items in content DM for digital items or just cultural heritage items in general, um, and how to um, weigh the the benefits that you get from using. Um, existing controlled vocabularies like AET or um, LCSH or, or VOF uh, versus building our own model that sort of encompasses those things. Um, and where, where's the trade-off? And I think that you figure trying to fi walk that fine line um, in which you have a model that can express the data in high enough fidelity to be useful, um, but also is not so complex that um, going back to one of the earlier questions, um, catalogers have to basically retrain themselves on how to describe things. Is finding a middle ground between those two things um, that's intuitive to use and interact with from the, from the cataloger or the data creator or curator's perspective, but also um, rich enough to be used, reused by um, either library patrons or um, folks on the web who just happen to be finding the data. Thanks, that's, uh, that's really useful to hear. Uh, and our, our colleague uh, in OCLC Research, Karen Smith Yoshimura, has a question for Jason and Mario. And uh, Jason, maybe I'll, I'll tag you first. What were the key differences for you to describe digitized content in Wikibase versus your current tools and systems? So I, in one sense, it was really easy. I handed the data off to, to Jeff and Bruce, and they took it from there. On the other hand, when we start to enter into new systems, it's sort of new business processes of how we describe things. And, and all of a sudden, we become sort of new at it, and it takes a little longer, and it's a little harder. And it's not so much that the difference is the Wikibase as a model, we can model it how we like. And as I think Jeff just mentioned, it can be as complex or as simple as we, as we foresee it or want it. I think the hard part and what we're gonna see hopefully in phase two as we move forward is the UX side of things. How does this scale, not as a system, but as a usable system for staff at libraries who are cataloging not one or two things at deep level, but thousands of things at once. How do we build the tools around the wiki base that allow for a workflow that is now at scale at the scale in which many of us are working? This isn't 15 years ago when we were scanning the 500 best photos from our collection. This is now where we're doing hundreds of thousands of scans a year in our labs. And how do we leverage Wikibase, not just to be robust in terms of storing our linked data, but robust enough in terms of our own ability, our own resource constraints and getting it in. Mario, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, not really, because uh, the first phase, uh, really a lot of the heavy lifting that was done um, for converting it over was done by Bruce and by Jeff. And I really appreciate that for them. I do concur that it's going to take um, a scaling of size and sort of a change of a mindset in that regard. Um, but I think that some, some of the tools that have been developed, like the image annotator, may make it a little easier if you can um, somehow farm this out to have people review it um, and, and create those of, ofnesses and aboutnesses for your work. So I think that might be a change, and that's going to have to be grappled with. Um, but beyond that, I'm not much up to that. Thanks. Um, and I don't see any other questions uh, that have come in. I just wanted to see if anybody else on the project team had any additional thoughts uh, in terms of what Jason and Mario had to say or Karen's question. 
Uh, this is Bruce again. And in just following up from what Jason and Mario said, and also looking back at, at Jeff's walkthrough, the phases of the project, I think we'll have a better answer uh, for the question about how Wikibase is performing and what the differences are for moving from cataloging one environment to another at the end of the second phase, because that's where we're really concentrating on using the Wikibase Software Foundation and any other tools we develop around it to facilitate that process. So we'll see, we'll see the paradigm shift more clearly, I think, in retrospect when we're when we've completed that phase, which will be in a few months. So we're all a third of the way through the project. We we have a lot left to learn about scalability and and this transition and where the, the costs and benefits are. Great, thank you, Bruce. And I think that's a great way to wrap up is to um, highlight that, that this is a work in progress. Um, and so we appreciate all of you for sharing the learnings so far. And I think it's a uh, stay tuned. There, there's going to be more to report and we'll be uh, sharing additional updates uh, in later phases of the project. So I just wanted to thank our panelists. Thank you for uh, sharing so much with us today. And for our attendees, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate your participation um, and your attendance. And uh, we will post a recording of this webinar online. I'll send a notification by email when that recording is available. It's going to include the slides uh, and also uh, the links and um, resources that were shared in chat. So thanks again to all for joining us. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you.